Well, once again, welcome to, uh, um, I want to say to both Bob Massey and to uh, Suzanne that these are, uh, these are writers. They are um, published writers. They are wannabe published writers. They are will be published writers. They're interested in the art of writing. And they obviously are interested in the two of you. And um, what a great pleasure it is for me, and I know for my colleague, Will Akers, uh, to welcome you all once more. I would remind you at the outset that uh, we're on television, that uh, what's said here today will be spread far and wide across <laughs> our uh, area. Uh, if you ask questions, uh, you may have to listen to it uh, later on. Um, so. Um, I want to urge you to ask questions, but I also want to remind you that uh, you may have to listen to what you ask and, and what's answered. It's great to have you all here, and um, it's especially uh, a treat uh, to welcome these two fine, these two distinguished authors. Um, Bob Massey, Bob Massey is, uh, is part of Nashville. Um, he's born in Lexington, but uh, Grew up here, went to school here, went to Peabody Demonstration School, uh, which is now the university school. Um, he was a journalist with Newsweek for uh, about almost 10 years, um, and then was with Sad Evening Post. Um, you know, uh, as well as I do, that his first book, Nicholas and Alexandra, was on the New York Times bestseller list for a year. And, um, I mean, if there is a foreign language, Nicholas and Alexandra, um, um, it was told in that language. Um, it was a worldwide success and um, introduced many people to the idea that reading history could not only be a good thing to do, it also could be uh, great entertaining. Um, Bob won the 1981 Pulitzer Prize for Biography for Peter the Great. <clears throat> most recent book, Catherine the Great, uh, Portrait of a Woman, uh, is a fascinating and gripping uh, book uh, about uh, the history of uh, another book about the history of Imperial Russia. Um, I've had an opportunity, and, 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 and uh, my friend Will Akers has had an opportunity now, too, and so has Suzanne. We've had lunch together, and we've talked a good deal about uh, what we're going to talk about today, writing. Um, as I say, um, it's great to have you here, my friend. Lovely to see Thank you God. again. And, and um, I think that uh, maybe, the most, maybe the most famous thing about Bob Massey to all of us here is that uh, at graduation every year, University School gives the Robert K. Massey Award for Research in European History. And uh, it's in Bob's name, and uh, it's a, I know he considers it a great honor. And, uh, and I, 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 I <coughs> having him here is a special honor for me because his mother, Molly Todd, some of you will remember Molly Todd, was a, uh, was a leader in this community in the area of uh, public education, um, in the area of civil rights, um, and in the area of political integrity. Uh, she played a real leadership role in some of the seminal moments in the history uh, of this community, particularly in those days uh, leading up to and, and the introduction of metropolitan government. Suzanne Kingsbury uh, comes from today from Connecticut, and we're so lucky to have her. Um, she was born in Baltimore, grew up in Guilford, Connecticut. Um, she's lived in Africa, Southeast Asia, Manhattan, the Deep South, the Southwest, Mexico, <laughs> yes, Mexico, and Panama. First novel, The Summer Fletcher Real Love Me, stunning coming of age novel about four young people during a steamy, hot, Mississippi, Hill Country Summer. Besides writing, she has choreographed for Bread and Puppet Theater. 
She's worked for a Jack what, damn boys? Yes. How about my French, huh? <laughs> and um, for his National Dance Institute in Soho. In 2006, she founded Wide, Wild Words, a program that provides mentoring and writing salons for kids and grown-ups and aims at reshaping the way writing is taught. Uh, the 2013 Writers Guild named her one of the nation's experts on creativity and, and the imaginative writing process. So uh, we're lucky to have them here and uh, ask you uh, to join me in giving them a national welcome. <laughs> and um, now I'll turn the program over to my colleague, Will Akers, who, as you know, um, We'll cross-examine them, and, um, and then cross-cross-examine them, and re-cross-cross-examine them, and then he will turn them uh, over to your tender mercies to cross-examine them further. Will? Okay, I, one thought I had is why these two here are together today is Nicholas and Alexandra and the Summer Fletcher Greel Love Me are both their first books, which I, that appealed to me. Both of them had a lot of research to get from where they, where they began to the end. And that also ties the two together. One's a novel, one's history. But there's a lot of commonality between your first book and doing a lot of research. So my first question for Suzanne, well, let's read first. Suzanne, you've all got the handout. Let's turn to Suzanne's page, the end of the Summer Fletcher Greel Love Me. I think I'm starting a sentence before y'all, but that's OK. Do you want to set it up and explain where we are in the story? We're, yeah, we're at the last, um, how is it, the last part of the book. And um, what's happened um, in the book is that there's been a, a, a really ho horrendous crime that's happened to um, this boy, Riley, who I'm going to read about. Um, to the, the woman, the, the girl he loves, something horrible's happened to her. And she's asked him not to retaliate. And so um, this is what Riley does. Riley stubs out his cigarette with his shoe toe on the cement and says, here goes nothing. Maybe this is a bad idea, I tell him. The eye, and this is Fletcher Greel, Riley's best friend. Riley reaches for the door, holds the handle a second, and without looking at me says, it was a bad idea a long time ago, Judge. But there ain't no turning back now. He takes his hand back and rips a dirty elastic out of his hair. It looks silky as a woman's. He runs a hand through it, bunches it in his fingers, and brings it around to his mouth to kiss it. You can't wear yourself on the outside, Judge. They'll kill you for it. And that ain't how I aim to go. Then he pulls the door open, steps in, and nods to me that I should follow. The floor of the shop is a dull mustard color. There are three barber chairs, but none are being used. The barber's got scotch tape glasses and white hair. His scissors are in the back pocket of his denims, and he has an afro to beat a bird's nest. He flaps down his newspaper and stares at us. Riley blinks rapidly and feels in his front pocket as if for change. I stand flat-footed with my heels burning in my shoes. There's a guy leaning against the far wall eating a donut and two men playing dominoes off an old suitcase in the back of the room. They watch us as if we were walking dead. Ceiling fans beat out a fast rhythm and no one moves. Finally, Riley says, y'all cut white boy's hair too? Eyes flicker and feet change weight from one side to the other. Then there's laughter, as if someone opened up a can of it and let loose. The room fills with it. The fat one eating a donut raises a hand and says, Welcome home, brother. The barber says, Sit down, boy. Of course we do. Of course we do. He points to one of the barber chairs and then nods to me and says, Sit where you want. There's donuts in the back and some coffee. Merry Christmas, he says. 
and smiles wide. Riley sits down and the man puts a smock around him. He pumps up the chair, but as he does it, a frown takes hold of his face. He picks Riley's hair up, looks at it uncertainly. You don't want to cut off this here head of hair, do you now, mister? It's a mighty fine ornament and must take a whole heap of time to grow. Riley looks at himself in the mirror. For a minute, I think he's going to change his mind. Instead, he says, let me just do this. He spins the chair around so he isn't facing himself anymore, and then he says, don't take your time. The barber shrugs, wipes the shears in his, on his denims, and begins to cut. He doesn't bother to wet Riley's hair or comb it. He goes at it with the relish of a man just new to pruning shears. I stand stunned at the doorway, and the men stop their donut eating and domino playing to watch with me as Riley's hair drops to the floor in curved softness, revealing his long, pale neck. The more the man cuts, the more Riley's face starts to look thin and bloodless, exposed. I wish I could tell the men to, come, to make him come to his senses, explain to them that this isn't at all what Riley looks like. I want to turn him around so he has to witness himself in this new, dull way. Maybe the barber would be able to fix it somehow. Only I have a feeling it wouldn't matter to Riley, that very little could matter. The barber keeps cutting his hair, like my mother used to clip dill into her salads, carelessly and happily, without much forethought at all. Yay, thank you. So, Bob, you'd read this before. What do you have to tell us? What do you think about it? What questions do you want to ask Suzanne about that selection that she read? Uh, before I say that, uh, I want to say this is a wonderful book. Um, it's a wonderful book because it, uh, it is, she has immersed herself and brought out everything I know about Mississippi. And I know something. I was a civil rights reporter in the 60s. Uh, I wrote several stories about Mississippi. I was there during the James Meredith effort to uh, enter the law school at Ole Miss. And the rednecks turned out in force and killed a couple of people. Uh, I saw a major general in the US Army get on up, up on a pedestal of statue of Robert E. Lee and incite the rednecks to go get their rifles. I heard the voice of President Kennedy coming through the tear gas, which the marshals had fired to drive back the crowd. And uh, after the smoke had cleared the next day, I was able to reach Meredith, who was under guard seclusion, and persuade him. I was writing a piece for the Saturday Evening Post persuade Meredith to write a piece of his uh, reasons for wanting to enter the law school and why he was uh, uh, able to carry on uh, through the terrible night. Uh, that Mississippi is, has changed, but some things don't change. The geography, the heat, mm -hmm. the language, used, uh, the racial uh, ties are not very solid. I interviewed a man named Medgar Evers for my piece. Later he was shot and killed. It took the state something like 40 or 50 years to send the assassin to jail. I felt when I was reading this book which is set more or less in the present time, uh, that I was going back to Mississippi. And uh, I have only met Suzanne a couple of hours ago. We had lunch. And she is from 
almost everywhere but the South and Mississippi. It's incredible, it's astonishing to me that she could get the sense of uh, the racial problems, the, the uh, geography, uh, the descriptions of the little towns, the language, and the feelings of many different uh, Mississippians. This is a, I'll, I'll embroider her description of what the book is about. It's two Romeo and Juliet stories interwoven on top of each other. A white boy and a white girl, both 16. Uh, the boy is coming home from a prep school. His father is the judge in town. The girl is a, a, a local girl. She's in high school. She's had more boyfriends than she wants. Uh, and the other boy, Riley, who's getting his hair cut, is uh, a friend of the upper strata boy who's going away to school and come back. And they're reunited their friendship for the summer. I'm sorry to take so long, but you need to know what this book is about. And neither you nor uh, John gave a, enough description. Uh, his girlfriend is an African-American girl, uh, beautiful, with a superb voice, and they're very much in love, which the town doesn't approve of. And what Suzanne said was a terrible event, was something the town did to her. And so I think that what Suzanne, I'm pretty sure, if I read it right, that why, why, why Riley goes to this African-American barber shop and gets his hair cut up. He wants to say to everybody that he is, he belongs to the African-American com community. And he stands by his girlfriend. And as Suzanne said, he, uh, is bound, held back only by the request, the plea of his girlfriend, who's been so vigorously, uh, vehemently uh, abused that he not do anything. So I found this, uh, it's very hard for me to believe that this is her first book. I hope and trust that it's not her last. Thank you. Now, can you read your piece, please? Is it here? It's here. OK, this is from my book, Nicholas Alexander, which is, uh, as John and, uh, and uh, Wiley said, it was my first book. I wrote it when I was uh, uh, between the ages of 35 and 37 or 38. Uh, I was a journalist. I was a reporter at Newsweek by then. Uh, my wife and I had three children, the first of whom my son, Bobby, was born with hemophilia. His blood didn't clot normally. Uh, it's a genetic disease passed once it's in the family from mother to son. It can all be, also be passed from mother to daughter, but it appears only uh, it doesn't in, infect her with the disease because she has another X chromosome, but she can pass the defective X chromosome along to her daughters. So I have a son with hemophilia and a grandson with hemophilia. And I wanted to write about it. Journalists want to write about what they care about. Was it Hemingway or Faulkner? Somebody said, write about what you know. And uh, I knew a lot about this. And most people didn't know anything. But uh, I couldn't. Nobody was interested in a, 
a story about a middle class family uh, with a disease for which there was no cure and which demanded enormous expenses in either uh, payment of money or finding of blood through sponsoring blood drives. We couldn't make it. And uh, my wife said, I'd already been, uh, I'd studied history at, at uh, Yale and Oxford. I knew something, what you all know, about uh, Nicholas II having a hemophiliac son. I started going and spending all my lunch hours uh, from Newsweek, walking down Fifth Avenue and at the New York Public Library. I found books. Uh, about uh, the Tsar and Imperial Russia and the court, many of them had not been read. Remember in the old days, some of us my age will remember, books were published with the pages still bound together here. So I had to take a, a letter opener and slit the pages. That copy of the book had never been read. Uh, and my mother-in-law, who had been a Swiss girl had gone to Russia in the early summer of 1914 and hadn't been able to get back because of the war, came back in 1920, worried about us. Bob is wasting all his, uh, all his extra time <laughs> writing this book. He doesn't know anything about it. And, uh, you know, Suzanne will, is an example, I'm another, of when a writer gets going, it's hard to stop him or her. Uh, so I did. Uh, when I turned it in, uh, I said, here's the book. It's going to be called Nicholas and Alexandra. And the president of the little company who'd given me a $2,500 advance said, uh, you can't call it that. I said, why not? He said, uh, because nobody's ever heard of them. Nobody's going to know who you're talking about. <laughs> and I, uh, emboldened by the uh, fact that I believed in it and didn't much care about $2,500, more or less wasn't going to solve our problem, I said, nevertheless, Mike, that's the title. And he shrugged, shrugged and that was the title. Well, now, now people have heard of it, heard of them. Anyway. <laughs> uh, this is the last uh, paragraph, really, of the book. But it says, I'm a, I'm a writer, not a talker. So this says better what I wanted to say about why I wrote the book. And it's the adios paragraph in, in this book. I've been talking about uh, the... Uh, pretenders after the Romanovs were murdered, the pretenders who sprouted up here, there, and everywhere to be this or that daughter, Anastasia, or Maria, or um, Tatiana, or Olga, or even the Tsar, the Tsarevich. Everybody was walking around London or New York or something and knocking on doors and saying, uh, uh, let me in, and by the way, I need money. Uh, because I'm the daughter of Nicholas II. So this paragraph begins, infinitely more remarkable and more faithfully enigmatic than the riddle of Anastasia is the awesome, overwhelming drama of the Russian Revolution itself. The rise of communism brought by Lenin to Russia its rooting there and the spreading of its doctrines and power around the globe are the pivotal historical events of our time. This was written in about 1965. Ironically, the two great communist nations, Russia and China, are the only world powers with which the United States has never warred. The current struggle dividing the world is not over trade 
or territory, but over ideology. This is the legacy of Lenin. And also the legacy of Rasputin and hemophilia. Kerensky once said, if there had been no Rasputin, there would have been no Lenin. If this is true, it is also true that if there had been no hemophilia, there would have been no Rasputin. This is not to say that everything that happened in Russia and the world has stemmed solely from the personal tragedy of a single boy. It is not to overlook the backwardness and restlessness of Russian society, the clamor for reform, the strain and battering of a world war, the gentle retiring nature of the last star. All of these had a powerful bruising impact on events. Even before the birth of the Tsarevich, autocracy was in retreat. Here precisely is the point. Had it not been for the agony of Alexis' hemophilia, had it not been for the desperation with, uh, which made his mother turn to Rasputin, first to save her son, and then to save the true autocracy, might not Nicholas II have continued retreating into the role of constitutional monarch so happily filled, filled by his look-alike cousin, King George V. It might have happened. And in fact, it was in the, this direction that Russian history was headed. In 1905, the Russian people had had a partial, partial revolution. Absolute power was struck from the hands of the Tsar with the creation of the Duma, the parliament. In the era of Solipin and the Third Duma, uh, cooperation between the throne and parliament reached a level of high promise for the future. During the war, the nation asked not for re revolution, but for reform. During the war, uh, sorry, uh, but uh, for a share of responsibility in fighting and winning the victory. But Alexandra, goaded by Rasputin, passionately objected to any sharing of the imperial power. She wanted to preserve it for her son. By giving way to his wife, by fighting to save the autocracy, and denying every plea for a responsible government, Nicholas made revolution and the eventual triumph of Lenin inevitable. Why Lenin triumphed, why Nicholas failed, why Alexandra, why Alexandra placed the fate of her son, her husband, and his empire in the hands of a wandering holy man, why Alexis suffered from hemophilia, these are the true riddles of this historical tale. All of them have answers, except perhaps the last. Thank you. Thank you. It's interesting to hear after having read it so many times. Suzanne, what do you want to say about the writing there? Well, it's interesting. Um, when you told me that that was the piece that we were to read, I thought, well, then I'm definitely going to have to read the whole book, <laughs> which I wanted to because Robert Massey is a literary icon. And um, this was a book that I hadn't, hadn't actually read until this time. I hate to admit that. The whole nation read it, except for me, I think. So um, I fell in love with, um, you know, I'm like a story girl. Like, I just love story. I, I want story. I'm not that interested in information, you know. So sometimes I get sort of stuck in fiction rather than nonfiction because I want a story so badly. And what really struck me about the, the um, the book was that it's such a story, you know, and, and it's, it's really your um, 
ability to create character. I mean, that not everyone can do that who's a nonfiction um, writer. You know, they, they tend to be sometimes a little bit wooden and cardboard. And here it's like Rasputin came alive. You could feel these two sides of him. You could see the eyes. I mean, ev every single person that came in from you know, seeing her and her gems that first time they appear in public together and just the detail is, is amazing. But what kept striking me about the story was how, you know, our mind sort of dichotomizes things, I think. Like, oh, here's, here's the government, you know, and then here's the personal and here's the religion. And, and then this is, this is all this big integrated whirlwind that's happening that nothing is really separate and and you sort of realize like nothing is separate you know we might think we're governed by these people who are only thinking about you know um, the state of the union or whatever but it th 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 that's never the case you know what's going on behind closed doors especially for them is is having an enormous impact but it really struck me I thought about you a lot while I was reading it and just your own personal story because Russia is so um, far from the US, especially when you're writing it, but the, the emotional content of the book was so personal. I mean, it was your son. And so, so when I felt that love for Nicholas and Alexander, which I did, I mean, I was in love with them. I was in love with them being in love with each other. And um, I just wondered how much that emotional bond with those characters had to do with your own relationship with with your son who you were trying to help survive? Uh, a very great deal. Uh, as I said, I, I read a lot about them. I knew I wanted to say something. I didn't know in what form. Uh, I've never written fiction. Uh, I don't think I could because I, uh, I think I've read uh, many novels. Um, your book teaches all of us about Mississippi in the way I've never read in a nonfiction book. But uh, I, I strongly believe uh, that, you know, fiction survives, great fiction survives. We are all reading, we all read all the great uh, 19th century novels. We don't read 19th century history books mm. or biographies and so forth. History creates great, uh, fiction creates great characters with whom we can all partially identify. They're going through some of the same uh, life situations that we go through. They're reacting. We learn from uh, how they reacted. I find myself once in a while thinking, this is just like Smithers or Jones mm -hmm. and so forth in Dickens or whatever. Uh, but I think uh, that uh, real people have undergone so many uh, uh, situations and challenges and so forth with which I can identify and which I think if people knew or read or knew somehow they could identify, and uh, the w reason one, uh, certainly I chose uh, a czar was not just, as you said, not just because uh, what he decided and his behavior and his decisions were uh, impacted the whole empire and the Russian people and all of Europe, because he was going through exactly the same thing we were going through, without as much medical help, mm -hmm. without being able to dull the pain of his child and so forth. So there was all, all this, uh, I'm not really a religious person, but I felt I had to do this. Uh, and we didn't know whether it was be successful or not, uh, but I felt if, I don't do it, and my wife helped me. It, it'll never be done. It's been, it was then 50 years. Now it's been 100 uh, since uh, the revolution and the uh, executions and so forth. 
So I felt, uh, this sounds awfully arrogant, but I felt chosen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, if not me, who? When? Uh, and as far as bringing him to life with the details, I wanted to do that, but there was all the material. I didn't have to uh, make it up. I mean, when the book was published, and I'll shut up, people would come up to me and say, I loved your novel. <laughs> and I would uh, build up my little defense and say, it's not a novel. Uh, will those wonderful conversations? No. Everything in the book uh, I took from people who were there. And if there's a conversation, they re reported the conversation. And my, finally, my wife said, shut up, Bob. They're telling you they love the book, and it reads like a novel. And so I shut up. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I do want to pe bring historical people alive. I want to show that the, the people who, the bad guys and the good guys, and the bad women and the good women, are human beings. Mm -hmm. um, look, if I could take two more minutes, I'll shut up for the rest of the <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> but I have also sim simply and simplistically thought of the difference between fiction and nonfiction as circus wire, uh, what do you call the guys who walk a wa across a wire and A hold, tight rope. What? Tight rope walker. Tight rope, of course. Uh, the difference is that a uh, uh, writer of fiction walks the tight rope uh, writing a novel and publishing a novel without a net. The writer of nonfiction does the same thing, but with a net. And if the writer of nonfiction, uh, of fiction, uh, nonfiction falls off, he still has the net of the fact that this really happened. Mm -hmm. So if you write a biography of Peter the Great and screw it up badly, there's still the fact of Peter, Great, Peter the Great being a real character, a towering character, and a, uh, in every sense, uh, and people may still buy the book, which would please the publisher and the author. Whereas, if a novelist falls off, there's no net. If he doesn't convince the reader that this is a story with which he or she can identify, uh, learn from, incorporate the universal uh, beliefs or behavior or challenges or response to challenges that he or she knows something about from uh, splat. <laughs> That's about it. Yeah. That's a perfect segue. Thank you very much. My question for Suzanne is, this is your first book. Mm -hmm. How did you fight self-doubt? And do you remember a low point in the whole process and did you ever want to quit? Um, I fought self-doubt by having absolutely no expectations of myself. So I didn't really want a book. I just couldn't stop writing fiction. You know, I, I was like a real liar as a kid. Like I always told lies. And, and my mother was just horrified. You know, I would tell all these lies and she would be like, why do you keep lying? But it was because I love to make up stories. So when I got old, you know, I wanted to be a dancer. I was dancing and um, I was telling these gentlemen at lunch that I wasn't very good at it. You know, I really wanted to be a dancer, but you know, I never really would have gone that far. But, but what I really wanted to do was to write all the time, but I just thought it was really boring. You know, I was gonna sit and you don't really socialize and you just sit there and write, and it, but I couldn't help it. So when I wrote that first book, I just thought, well, I'm gonna take a year off and try to write this book because I, love writing, but I'm not going to be an author or anything. 
Isn't that weird? So I lived in this little cabin, and you know, I went down and lived in, in Oxford and met all these writers, and you know, they would find out I was writing a book, and then they were like, oh, that's, you know, you can come read here when you're done, and I was, but I did, I sent it out on a whim, and um, I went down to Mexico, because I had a little money left from my year off, and I thought, well, I'll just live in Mexico, and you know, just sort of play around for a while. And then I started getting these emails from these agents because I had sent the book out on women and they wanted the book and the book wound up selling very quickly for um, a good amount of money and you know, film stuff started coming and sold in a week and um, I had never published anything before or anything. So my self-doubt came afterwards once I got the book out and then I had to do book tour and talk to all these people in New York who you know they're not always that friendly and and the whole process had been so fun I'd been in my imagination and it had just been something that I loved to do and now I was having to talk to these people that talk so fast I couldn't I didn't even feel like I spoke their language like I just thought is this English or is this some other language I was supposed to learn a long time ago so that's when self-doubt came in, and, um, and it's pretty much stayed. <laughs> I still have a lot of it. But you've finished it, you've got a second book that's out. Yeah, and then I'm working on my third. I just, I pulled my third. It was in the agent's hands, and she was shop, shopping and getting a lot of interest, and I pulled it because I just didn't think it was ready. I mean, I was really pushed into that third book to have it ready and it just didn't it never really felt and you didn't just pull it you threw it away well I didn't it's in a it's in a little drawer that maybe I'll go back to sometime but I didn't I did yeah I, I stopped working on it I, I pulled it and then I started working on something else and this one's coming together really in a very synergistic way I'm really lucky but that one never did it, it you know it was interesting I really I am so um, admiring of nonfiction writers like I feel like I really lean on my imagination in a way like oh it's too hard to stick to the truth so I'll just sort of lean on making stuff up so when I said that thing about nonfiction it's my maybe it's a little jealousy that keeps me from <laughs> reading it how does this person make such a beautiful story and not even have to make anything up but um the, sec the third book was very based on a true story, and it was, t it was the imagination wasn't able to massage it enough to make it into It's novel. hard to turn real life into fiction. It's very tough, because you get stuck. Yeah. I've got a question for Bob. This is in the book. I've been waiting to ask this question for 22 years. It's a teeny tiny minor question, so forgive me how small it is, but I just, it says, accordingly on April 9th, Lenin, Krupskaya and 17 other Bolsheviks ex Bolshevik exiles left Zurich to cross Germany in a sealed train. The German leaders, said Winston Churchill, turned upon Russia the most grisly of all weapons. They transported Lenin in a sealed truck like a plague bacillus from Switzerland into Russia. What is a sealed train? <laughs> I'm dying to know. Uh, is it like a different... I don't know. Uh, I've never asked that question to myself. I would assume, uh, Will, that it was a train which was not to be, uh, the car at least, was under guard. It was not to be uh, molested. Uh, the passengers were not to be uh, uh, interrogated. Uh, sort of like, as Churchill said, uh, a deadly bacillus that was on ice and transported. The Germans knew very well that uh, Lenin's arrival in a crumbling uh, Russian Russia and situation where the dynasty was falling apart and the government couldn't feed the people, especially in Petersburg, the capital, that Lenin injected into this would uh, uh, greatly affect whatever war effort Russia had left in, in it and uh, make it easier for them. The act, exact arrangements uh, of his uh, uh, transport, I really don't know. But the Germans are pretty good about transporting 
uh, people on trains. They did a lot in the Second World War. Uh, and uh, they got Lenin there. Uh, I, was, I didn't con concentrate on it. Perhaps I should have said more. But I just wanted him to get there. I wasn't <laughs> happy about dealing with Lenin. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to talk about Lenin. Mm -hmm. You know, um, when Nicholas Alexander was published, uh, it was in 1967, and the uh, Soviet U uh, authorities reacted. Uh, this is a, it was their 50th anniversary of the revolution. This is a CIA uh, hack writing propagandist to spoil our revolutionary. Uh, he's making a, a good guy out of, Len, of, of Nicholas, et cetera, et cetera. Later, they, uh, when American tourists were arriving with the book, the Soviets didn't know anything about it, but somebody had one. Oh, this is the original copy. And this is the flag of Imperial Russia, brought back by Peter the Great from Holland in uh, uh, the beginning of his reign, when he went out to bring back uh, people of all talents to uh, modernize Russia. And uh, he simply took the uh, Dutch flag, which was vertical red, white, and blue, and turned it to white, blue, and red. And when the empire fell, it was uh, replaced, by, as we all know, by the uh, red banner of hammer and sickle. Uh, but nobody even knew that, the border guards, the customs agents. So this was carried in. Uh, and uh, once the authorities started to worry about it, uh, it was uh, copied by people who wanted to spread it around in what the Russian calls samizdat, self-publishing, typed up and distributed that way. Uh, I'm happy to report that now this is the flag of Russia. It flies on their merchant shipping, on their naval shipping. It, blow, it is the great flag flying over the Kremlin. The red flag is gone. Uh, this was not my triumph, but uh, we chose the right cover. Um, what you? What was your question? You answered it about the sealed train. I'm going to change <laughs> change subject to, for both of you. Did you have a writing teacher who taught you something that you're still using? Who are you talking to? Both of you, one after the other. You go first. No. Okay. Uh, I I had been a journalist. I I, I was saying to John Siegenthaler, uh, I didn't always like. Uh, what the editors did to what I wrote, because they were wrong and I was right. But my wife said, Bob, the newspaper or the magazine belongs to them. They're responsible for putting out the thing every day or every week. The writer has to do what he's told. But if you write a book, you have more elbow room. So that's why, and I was, uh, I don't think I'm contentious but I was independent. I want to write what I wanted to say. And so I wrote a book. Did you have a writing teacher? Um, I didn't really. I, I um, tested out of English in college, so I never took an English class. I just was so in love with books that I was felt like if I kept doing it in college, I would never do my other work. So I sort of swore off novels for four years. I did go out and work with the head of the Iowa Writers um, program, Frank Conroy, I worked with him for three and a half weeks on Fletcher Grill, and that was really amazing. He's just an amazing person, amazing editor, really, I mean, as well as memoirist. And, um, but I got most of my training when I went to Oxford, because, you know, Larry Brown was there then, and we became friends, and he talked to me a lot about the process. And then, you know, Jill McCorkle was going through there, and a lot of people knew Ms. Welty, and, you know, there was just a lot of sort of writers talking about writing and craft down there. So I think that was really my coming of age as a novelist, was being able to live in Oxford and, 
and being surrounded by writers and square books and, you know. Talking about it a lot. All the time, talking about books and why they were great. I mean, just over, you know, drinks and dinner or whatever was real, it's really part of the culture there. So that helped me probably more than anything else. And in your book, the first <coughs> chapter is from Kaylee's point of view, and then the next chapter is Fletcher's point of view, and then back and forth, and it alternates the whole way. It works. Mm. How hard was it to keep, the, keep it separate? How did you keep it separate? You mean the voices? The voices. Um, when I write, I, I have a weird experience where um, I'm in the body of the person. I mean, that sounds really weird. Maybe some of you who are writers have had that feeling of being in the body. So it was never um, mixed up because I could feel myself be in that body. It's, very strange, but that's how it feels. Did you write a Haley chapter and a Fletcher chapter, or did you write a Haley, Haley, Haley? No, I, I write what comes to me when I sit down. So, oh, Haley's here today, so then I would write a scene. So my whole book was written actually in scenes, and then afterwards I saw, oh, wow, these scenes fit together like a puzzle. Even though, you know, I would write the ending maybe at the beginning or the beginning at the end. But I, I remember the moment where I realized, oh, the, the novel just finished itself. It was like waking up and seeing crop circles or something. It was very weird, even though it wasn't in order. And then when I spread them out, I could see, oh, wow, this goes first, this goes second. So I have to say, I don't, I don't have that much control over the process. Something is controlling it, and it doesn't really good job sometimes <laughs> finishing itself and figuring itself out and I can if I can let, let go of the reins it'll sort of run in the right direction. Do you then have to do a lot of rewriting? Uh-huh. Oh god, yeah. I mean so much like there was a crystal point of view. There's two points of view in the book, Haley and Fletcher. There was a crystal point of view in there about her whole life and you know there was like the mother. I mean uh, there were so many people in this book. Because unless I knew them, I couldn't have pared it down to those two characters to know that that's where the story came from. A tremendous amount of rewriting, a tremendous amount. I mean, even though I write like that and it's done, it's not done. Like, the scenes are horrible and they're all over the place and none of the paragraphs are sort of finished yet. I mean, even when I look at this book now, it, the paragraphing isn't, isn't good. And there's a lot that I would, you know, of course do now that I'm older. It's too late. I know. <laughs> Thanks for telling me. Don't touch it. And don't touch anything. Thank you. It's a wonderful book. Thank you. And I want to read something um, from Bob's book, and then I have a question. To those who remember it, the winter season in St. Petersburg following the, oh boy, here's a big word, hold on. The winter season <laughs> in St. Petersburg following the tercentenary seemed especially brilliant. And it says, to those who remember it, and I began to think, well, you must have talked to people. And then I thought, well, who was the oldest person you interviewed? And then my next, my real question is, what advice can you give us as an interview technique, or how would you approach talking to somebody to find out what they knew that could be helpful to you? That's two tough questions layered on top of each other. Um, the oldest person, I guess, I talked to Alexander Kerensky, who was the, who was in the Duma, a young man from the Volga region, and uh, a university student. Uh, he was a became a lawyer. He entered the Duma when the Tsar abdicated, and his brother refused to take the throne. A, a, a group of Duma ministers not very good administrators, took over. It was a provisional government, and Kerensky was the Minister of Justice. And then, as the government in Petersburg, it was then called Petrograd, uh, continued to crumble. He became the sort of de facto prime minister and continued in that role uh, until the uh, Bolshevik coup d'etat in uh, the fall of 1917, uh, he came to the, he escaped, came to the West, and came to the United States, where he lived the rest of his life 
uh, he didn't have a happy life because uh, monarchists, those who survived and got away, hated him because he'd been, uh, he had detained the Tsar and the family first in uh, their palace outside St. Petersburg. Then he sent them to Siberia, but really his motive was, uh, he couldn't send them to England uh, where George V had not been anxious to have them because he f uh, felt that having his cousin, an autocrat, would stir up the... As the war progressed, the First World War, and millions were dying, uh, uh, the, the, the tendency towards uh, left politics was growing stronger and stronger. Uh, Lloyd George was the prime minister. He didn't want the Tsar there. Um, sort of the way Jimmy Carter faced the pros possibility of the Shah coming after the Iranian revolution. Anyway, uh, the, the, uh, uh, well, what was the question? I forgot Where to. Where was I going? I, I, this is what happens. Turn uh, my page. Yeah, well, anyway, that's my answer. <laughs> I got another one. Has getting access to material become easier or more difficult? To me? Mm -hmm. uh, easier. Easier. Um, there, you know, Nicholas and Alexandra were, by the time I got to them, they, they weren't enemies of the people, they were unpersons. They'd been so thoroughly and successfully dismissed uh, that they weren't troubling the, the people in power in the Kremlin uh, anymore. So, uh, but they still weren't uh, opening up the archives and so forth. When uh, uh, I went there, my first wife Sue and I went there, we wanted to go to the Lavadia Palace in the Crimea, which uh, Nicholas built for Alexandra in 1911. Uh, we uh, didn't want to provoke them by saying, we want to go and see the palace where... So he said, we want to go and see the palace where uh, Stalin, Churchill, and Roosevelt met for the Alta Conference, mm -hmm. which was the same palace. We struck out there because we got there and it was a sanatorium. All of those buildings were being used uh, for people who suffered from TB and so forth. We went back uh, in the 80s, uh, I guess it was the 90s, after the fall of Gorbachev and the Soviet Union. They were, it was a monument to Nicholas and Alexandra. There were uh, statues and portraits and lots and lots of photographs all around. So the Russians have come to terms with that historical period they're never going to go back, but uh, uh, they're accepting their history. Mm -hmm. Suzanne. Yeah. You teach writing. Mm -hmm. What's the hardest thing to teach beginning writers? Um, the intuitive process of writing. So um, we're really taught in a way to control things in our society. It's normal, like to have a to-do list and everything we learn is really um, about control and about how to control whatever we're learning. And um, a lot of writing is actually letting go of that container at the beginning and being able to um, trust that the work is going to lead the process rather than the author. Um, and it's an unlearning, really, um, that has to happen. Um, they want to know wh where is it going, when is it going to end, wh when am I going to have a finished product, and that sort of thing. And to say to someone, well, actually, the work will show you, you know, is they're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. So I would say for me, teaching, teaching the intuitive, teaching them to lean into the intuitive, um, 
and then the self the self doubt like you were talking about is very very big for people um, when they begin to lean into the intuitive especially the self doubt comes up and this isn't okay and I need to know things and you know and how do you help them defeat that um, I actually lean on a um, study that was done about the creative process at um at Penn and Harvard, they both of them did this sort of think tank around the creative process. And what they found was if you can let, teach your students to let go of resistance, then the, the, the creative genius that arises is really quite amazing. So when I look at a writer's, new writer's work for the first time, I really look at what they're, they're intuitively doing well, what their innate skills are already that are, that, that are showing up on the page. Some people are very, very good at character building. Some people are great right away at plot. Some people, you know, whatever, they have the authorial voice. Whatever it is, I try to teach them to lean into those strengths. And once they know what their strengths are, their doubt can sort of take a back seat and then I give them skills. I never, I never criticize the work. I always say, now here are a list of tools that you can use in your work that they don't know yet. So of course it's not showing up in their work yet. It's not this isn't right and that's not, it's now you know what you're doing right, now here's some tools that you can use when you approach the work again. It's much faster to teach that way, students learn much more quickly and it just creates a really great um, relationship between me and the, the writer. Well, this is a sentence from your book, it's, and the prose is so inventive and it's so fresh to read as opposed to saying Big Bertha was fat, which is what I would have written the first draft. It says, Big Bertha looks like the human equivalent of a water tank. And I just think that's great. Does this come easy? Do you have to massage it? Do you have to pound it to get there? Or how does it work? Well, she did look like the human equivalent. <laughs> I guess that's sort of how my mind works. Like those associations just sort of pop up. So no, I, I don't have to work at that. Maybe if I were teaching myself writing, I would tell her, well, lean into this, these descriptions that you do, because yeah, my mind makes those, those associations right, right away. But you know, I think the South taught me that. Because that's a lot of how people speak in the South. I mean, like my friend Marshall who's in the back, like she'll just like crack you up with things like that. Like, like she was saying, we were at this thing this past two days and there were a lot of people talking. And she said, you know, the last time I was here, people weren't talking this much. It's like we walked into a convention of magpies. And like, that's pretty funny, you know what I mean? It just comes out like that. So I think probably that was already in me. And then when I got to the South and I kept hearing it, it helped a lot. Okay, Bob, you, the, the book is big and fat and required a lot of research. Did you ever have any, were you ever worried, did you ever get any trouble you, of losing the story in the facts? No. Um, <laughs> I don't think so. I could, I could uh, stand back um, the way Suzanne is telling her students to st stand back, look at it, and then go with it, go with the intuitive feeling they have about this scene or this character and so forth. Uh, this, this story was so compelling, not because of me, because it was, and these what happened was so dramatic and heartrending in some parts um, that I just had to write it down. I, I guess there is some, it's not as inventive in language as Suzanne's book. Uh, I guess I felt I didn't consciously feel, but I guess I was constrained to some degree by the fact that I was trying to write as accurately as I could. Mm -hmm. I didn't worry about somebody calling me out, saying the grass wasn't green, it was purple, for example, or the facts were wrong, because uh, I knew they were pretty much right. And remember, uh, with this book, as with her first book, nobody'd heard of me. And if I got something wrong, nobody was gonna worry about telling me or the world 
that this book is full of nonsense. Um, I knew I had the basic story right. And uh, I did have a very good editor. I've had two very good editors in my two wives. And they don't have any hesitation about saying, oh my god, <laughs> you got to get rid of this. Uh, you're, you're sinking and you don't realize it because you've gone too far or, or maybe there's not enough. And, and to respond to something Suzanne said, she, uh, I didn't know she, you taught, uh, and you're telling people how to deal with self-doubt and, mm -hmm. and worry and so forth. But you've already told us that you are worried and you pulled a book because you doubted that it was right. Talk to yourself. Lean in. I want to read the book you put in a drawer. All right, I'll send it to you. <laughs> then, you'll, then you'll think, oh, OK, I get it. And then the natural question, a uh, professional question, who is your editor who uh, may have cast the, the doubt? I, I don't want to know. But editors are there to help you. If they don't help you, find a new one. Mm -hmm. Go to somebody up, up the ladder and say, I love her, but something's wrong. Mm -hmm. You don't need advice from me. You know that. You've got to realize how good you are. <laughs> I'm a fan. I am too. I preface this a little my note to say at the very beginning was these are two of the best books I've ever read, which I don't say very often. Um, Suzanne, how do you know where to begin the story? Do you begin here or there? Is there the process to figure it out, or did you always know where the thing was going to kick off? Well, we were just talking about that at lunch because I was saying that... Um, Robert Massey's book starts, you know, before Nicholas and Alexandra um, are an item. And I love that choice, knowing about, you know, the parents. And in fiction, they talk a lot about, you know, don't do your backstory too, too early, integrated into the book, because, you know, you want to start with the action. So in the novel, it's important, I think, um, to start after what I call the kicker. So the kicker is something that I think of as starting a book off, a novel off. It, there has to be some reason that I'm telling you this story. There, the kicker is like if you can think of a ball going up and that's your story, it's like there has to be some momentum that kicks that ball. So what happened before the book began that's going to create enough momentum that you're going to be able to arc the story and then you know do your tiny denouement, which should be about a page or two. So um, it had to happen. The, the book had to start after the murder of the, of the horse trader, and it had to start after Fletcher got home. You know, so it couldn't be. You know, we're seeing Fletcher's last day, and you know the murder hasn't happened yet. Then why? Why have the book? What's what's going to create that momentum of the arc? So um, so I always look for the kicker. And Haley was already involved with Bo. I don't she was, you know this because you haven't read the book yet. She was already involved with her father's best friend, unfortunately. But um, <laughs> makes for a good book. Um, and she had already gone out with Hannaford, who creates the... And they'd already broken up. And they'd already broken up. And he created the perpetration of the crime that, that you all heard the aftermath of. So those things, there has to be stuff going on before the book starts, and then there's a whole life after the last page is turned, right? So the book exists in this period of time, um, but did it can't Did you write exist. the setup and cut it, or did you never write it? Yeah, I always, I always write the kicker, and um, I have to then see, what is the kicker? Where does this book begin? I mean, it's, for me, it's not clear at all where the book begins. I write so many scenes, and then... So you don't have a detailed one point and another and another outline? No. You just let her rip? No, I could never do that, because I'm not a rule girl. You know, that would make me feel like I was in a box or something. I really have to let the book tell me and write as many scenes as possible. And it's never wasting time. 
because you know so much about your characters and what they've been through and who they are and how they relate to stuff. And the fact that a scene doesn't make it in a book, I mean, you don't say every thought you think, God, God forbid. So it's similar. It's like I'm not going to put every single scene I ever wrote in that book. It would be ridiculous. It wouldn't be a good book anymore. But yeah, that's a hard one to figure out where it begins. But there has to be a kicker. Bob, talk to me about the role curiosity's played in your work. I will, but let me add something Please. here. Uh, the I'm talking to you guys. Uh, Suzanne ends the book absolutely wonderfully with a partial resolution. She tells you what happened next to each of the four main characters. But she leaves you with, in the last two or three pages, with a sense of, if you have any romantic soul left in you, with a hope that somehow the two couples get back together. She doesn't encourage you to believe that. And life experience of most of us would indicate that they don't, they, they can't. They've done their, they've had their experience together, but they're so, uh, she creates a real love between two people here and two people here. And you hope that they can somehow, somehow I'm also a romantic, that they can somehow get back together, even while you realize that it's very unlikely. Mm. What Curiosity. What, you seem to be curious about finding things out, and that drives you to write and discover. Yeah. Yeah, well, certainly with Nicholas, I wanted to know about hemophilia in the early 19th century and uh, what influence it played. I mean, everybody knew one paragraph's worth. The kid had a blood disease. Uh, Rasputin was a, a wandering uh, sh charlatan calling himself a monk. He had apparently uh, hypnotic powers. In the, this book, I think it's in this edition, there's a picture of him which stares out at you and practically makes you go to sleep on the, on the uh, looking at the picture. But uh, what did he do? I was curious. And I was also curious because hypnosis was being suggested as a treatment to relieve hemophiliacs in the 50s and 60s from pain. Mm. If you could tranquilize or lower the level of agitation uh, in a, a, a bleeding young man or boy, it would uh, maybe lower the blood pressure and therefore decrease the pressure on the rupture in the vein, uh, forcing the blood to flow out of the the vein and infiltrate all the tissue around. And he could certainly do that. He would come in. He had absolute confidence uh, in himself. He would come in and tell Alexei the stories. Uh, uh, nobody described uh, him going down and staring at the eyes of the boy and saying, you're going to sleep. But, but, uh, after the book was published, uh, I was asked to go on cruise ships and, and talk about the book. And I went on one, and there were uh, a lot of doctors taking a tax-deductible cruise in the Black Sea uh, talking about uh, control of pain. And when they saw that I was on there, they invited me to come to their sessions. We got to uh, Yalta, and we got on buses, and we were going around to visit various palaces. I guess the day before, I'd been, we'd been in Odessa. And some of you have seen the Soviet movie Potemkin, Battleship Potemkin. And I was trying to see over the crowd. So I w was younger then, and I was running. I leaped up to, to get on a pedestal where there was a big uh, uh, light. And I fell before I got there, and I 
fell against this and I hurt my uh, leg. So the next day we were at this palace and I was limping. And Dabney Ewan, a, a, a surgeon from uh, New Orleans, came up and said, what's the matter? I said, I told him. He said, Bob, if you'll come with me, uh, I'll try and help you. And one of the methods they were talking about, the, the mind-body relationship and re reducing stress, reduce, reducing pain, and so forth. And see, can I take this, it take two more minutes? Sure. Uh, he said, Bob, I want you to uh, uh, close your eyes. He put his arm around yeah. my shoulder. And he said, uh, you are sitting, your leg is in a very cold stream. And it's mm. coursing over your leg. And you have to realize that pain, the p function of pain is that the part of the, a part of the body is injured. And through pain, it's telling the brain, do something about it. Take care of it. React. Mm. But you know there's nothing you can do. You're overcoming the pain to walk, and so let's get rid of some of it. And he said, the, some, something you think it, it was mumbo jumbo, I certainly did. The pain is decreasing, Bob. Meanwhile, my wife was over telling the guards outside the palace uh, not to throw buckets of cold water over us. We weren't drunks. He, he was doing this cradling me, and this was one drunk uh, trying to prop up another uh, American and so forth. So she warded them off. Later, when we got back to the ship, Dabney said, come down to my cabin, and I'll try and reduce, the, uh, increase the suggestion. And he said, uh, uh, now uh, uh, I'm going to show you what the power of suggestion is. This was a a prominent, very well, highly regarded physician. He, it wasn't just some quack. And he said, Bob, uh, to demonstrate this, hold your thumb down as tightly as you can. Close your eyes and listen to me. And give me as much attention as you can. He said, hold your, don't let your thumb rise. I'm going to suggest to you that your thumb will rise in a few minutes when I tell it to. And I said to myself, by God, it's not going to rise. And so Dabney started his, his soft voice. You know, I don't know what he said. I knew we were still in a cabin on a ship. I knew who I was. I knew who he was. And he kept talking for a few minutes. And I was fighting it to force it back down. And then he did a little bit more. And I, I can't say it was all gone, but I walked out there with a, a limp. Wow. So uh, I haven't pursued that. But uh, a lot of people in medicine whom we were close to said <coughs> we're only the periphery of understanding the mind-body relationship. And another story, I'm a storyteller and I tend to hog the show, but I'll shut up after this. At some, uh, on some book tour, uh, I met Peter, Paul, and Mary. They were still young, I was still young, and we liked each other. They were, it was in Toronto, they were giving a concert, and I was a uh, book, book tour. And they invited me to uh, a uh, 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 their concert. And afterwards, we saw each other. They met my wife and son, Bobby. And we invited them out of the house one night. This was months later. And Peter Yarrow uh, said, where's Bobby? Well, he was upstairs uh, in a lot of pain. And we were trying to carry on with the party. And Peter said, Sue, I know you uh, play the guitar. Can I borrow it? And she gave him the car, guitar, and he went upstairs. And before very long, the other two followed him. Uh, there were 10 or more people 
still downstairs. And they were upstairs for 45 minutes playing for him. And uh, he went to sleep. And the next morning he woke up and he was much better. Excellent. Suzanne, I have a question about writing again, literary prose versus too literary. And your, yeah. your work is really good. Is there ever, does it ever, can you, can, can a writer get so highfalutin that nobody can understand it? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's probably one of the main things I see when I get sent work by people who want to um, work on a book. It's like they're using words that nobody, nobody really talks like that. And they feel like they have to because that's writing. Um, who tells them that? Why do they think that? I don't know, like, well, f first of all, I just want to say, like, Larry Brown, um, you know, great Mississippi novelist, he, he sent out work for a long, long time before he got published, and um, he kept getting rejected and rejected and rejected. And I can't remember which journal it was, but they finally said to him, if you would just write like you talk, you would start to get published. And so he started to write like he talked. And then he started getting published. And um, I think it's, I think something happens when we learn to write in school that um, it's not natural, at least, you know, I, I can't say now because I don't know how they're teaching it really um, across the board. But, you know, when we were taught to write, it was very strict and the diagramming and, you know, everything came first that was this rigid rules and we weren't, we didn't, weren't taught to express with our writing first and then taught how to make it clean and neat. So it's, people approach the page with this feeling, you know, I have to make it good, I have to make it important, I have to, and it's not at all, um, what good writing asks for. It really is about writing like I mean, not exactly like you talk because we say way too many words, but um, that that casual naturalness that that we can um, use to express ourselves, so that we're meeting the reader instead of, you know, um, intimidating the reader, or pushing the reader away. It's or really trying to impress them. Trying to impress them, yeah, and that's just the self doubt. You know, it's not it's not like they're trying to be bigger. It's just they're they're um, ashamed almost. Of who Did, they might be if they were normal. <laughs> in in um, in Fletcher Grill, there's a barber shop that's half barber shop down one side and half beauty parlor down the other. Did you make that up or did you see it? No, I, I made that up. I mean, um, I love going to beauty parlors in the South because in the North they don't do beauty as well as they do the South. So I, I loved going, getting my nails done and stuff in the South, and there was always great conversation because it was a great meeting place. Um, and then I thought, wouldn't it be fun if the boys were here? <laughs> and we could like, like go in with my boyfriend while he got his face shaved and I get my nails done. So I was just sort of like a fun thing, <laughs> a fun idea I had that I put in there. Because you can't tell whether it was real or made up when you read it. Right, well, it was totally made up. Were there things in there that were real that you just picked up and moved into the book? About that particular scene? Or no, just in general, anything. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, most of that. Most of that I either heard in stories or saw myself, like, you know, when they're in South Carolina and they're in the holding pen, you know, and that's all a story I heard at a bar one night. This guy was in a holding pen just like that one when they're caught for having a little marijuana and they're convertible. <laughs> so that, yeah, stuff like that. It's like all the dog stuff. I mean, I just heard so many stories and saw so much that I just put so it right the in same, there. So the same question I asked Bob earlier, did the research, did the finding the facts, the things that you heard, did it ever get in the way of the actual story? Or were um, you able to keep it separate? With that book, I could keep it separate. I mean, I think I, I researched a little, maybe a little too long. Um, that was back with the microfiche and stuff, so I was in the library, Ole Miss Library all the time and listening to Alan Lomax and all those recordings, the blues recordings, to try to get the blues right. And, you know, it was a tremendous amount of research went into that book. For a while I wasn't writing at all, really. I was just researching. Um, and that, uh, at some point I realized I've, got, I've just got to stop and I've got to write, you know, go back to the story. So did you go down there with a story in mind, or did you go down there and then found a story? 
It was sort of like a scavenger hunt. I'd written the rough draft. I knew what the arc was and what was going to happen and everything. And then um, I had to go, and I'd written that, you know, just on my off time. Um, well, actually, sometimes at work, I would, <laughs> I would sort of pretend I was working and working. And then um, when I went down south, I had to make sure. I mean, they all happened to be southern names. It was very uncanny how much was, it was almost like divine intervention when I went down to do my scavenger hunt to live down there. It was like so much was somehow came to me and was spot on. But a lot of it was filled in, you know. It was the rough draft is sort of like my outline. I let it go, and then I see where what the story is, and then after that I rewrite the whole thing, probably. And I don't mean I revise. I mean I rewrite the entire book, probably two, maybe three times. And in that rewriting, I fill in a lot. So, so it, how, what was, the, I'm gonna ask Bob the same question. What was the percentage of the research percentage versus the writing percentage? I want to say 70-30, but I don't know. I don't really know, because even when I was writing, I was researching. Like, just research was about 70-30. But then, as I was working on these rewrites and rewrites, I would also be researching. So, you know, maybe 50-50 in the end. Mm -hmm. And Bob, how about for you and Nicholas and Alexandra? Well, I, it's hard to say. Um, I would give the same answer that uh, Suzanne did. Um, you have to do the research to know what you're going to write about. And then you go back to add maybe something you're dubious about, which isn't intrinsic, necessary, you can take out. Um, I didn't go back to uh, learn what to say in, in terms of how to say it, I, I went back to, to learn whether this was uh, relative and necessary and mm. contributed to uh, advancing the story. And I, uh, I love, uh, I don't think novels can use this, but I love good uh, footnotes. And I have to uh, curtail my um, use of them because you don't want the reader all sitting, well, this is boring, but the, the footnote is really interesting. <laughs> uh, uh, but there is some stuff which doesn't go in here, which is not advancing the story. But you are saying, as you would in a conversation, by the way, off the subject, but uh, he murdered 16 wives, and uh, before he got became emperor of Timbuktu, or something like that. Mm. I mean, there were there are stories, true stories, of in European history which are unbelievably horrible or unbelievably uh, less horrible. A anyway, I I I know what she's talking about: 70, 30, but maybe 50, 50. Mm. Um, once I got, uh, got started, I think it was less uh, tentative than Suzanne is saying she was with her first book and with her third, mm -hmm. the one in the drawer. Um, maybe it was arrogance, maybe it was self-confidence, mostly it was a deadline. Mm -hmm. For example, I've got a I signed a contract to write a book two years ago. I haven't written a word, because I've been going around talking about Catherine the Great. I am under a lot of pressure, mostly in my head. But I'm going to go have back and uh, do more research and sit in my little room. I'm looking forward to it. But sit in my little room and churn out enough pages to uh, justify the next uh, increment of my advance. Publishers aren't in it for the love of art and literature. They're in it to make money. And no matter how much success you've had in the past, they want to know what you, what's, what are you doing now? What are you doing for me lately? Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
and I don't blame them. So I work on good excuses. <laughs> <laughs> Who's got a question? <clears throat> yes, sir. Did you run any translation problems from the Russian language? Uh, the first book, I didn't speak Russian, Nicholas. Um, I was uh, determined to tell the hemophilia story. I knew that I was the world's leading unpublished authority on being a hemophilia father. Um, and uh, there, was also, there were also uh, a lot of, there was a lot of previous information, some of it right and some of it wrong. Uh, and everybody who got away from grand duchesses, duchesses to chambermaids made their first few dollars or pounds or francs or whatever, marks, writing, I was at the imperial court. Some of it was demonstrably fiction, but uh, there was an awful lot of stuff. And then over the years, I mean, I was coming along in the 60s, over the years, the uh, various people like the Stanford uh, War and Peace Institute had translated many of the government documents and uh, uh, telegrams and so forth to uh, back up the history of the coming of the war and so forth. There, there had been books written from different perspectives, as I say, uh, and you had to decide which were more, if they collided, which was, who was more va uh, valuable, especially in descriptions of the bleeding episodes of the child. There was the doctor, uh, Nicholas's sisters, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but during that, uh, five or six years, uh, I wanted to learn Russian. I really didn't have time. I was being a journalist to put bread on the table and also writing this book. Uh, I knew the, I had a 200 word vocabulary. But after that, I wanted to know more. And I had become interested in the story of Peter the Great, the life of Peter the Great. And I found that there wasn't a good biography in English. Uh, since the 1870s. And so then I started uh, going to Berlitz. Uh, I got a, a teacher. I learned to read poorly, I guess, with a, with a uh, uh, dictionary um, and to speak. And we were going to Russia fairly often. And of course my Russian uh, would increase over an evening uh, of drinking vodka. I stopped worrying about the masculine, feminine endings of verbs and nouns and adjectives. I could speak freely. And uh, most of them, most of the people I'm talking about, this was in Leningrad, that could speak English better than I spoke Russian. But I learned enough. I, uh, when the Battle of Poltava came along, there was a wonderful book about the Russian cavalry and Poltava, the artillery, and it was full of uh, uh, specific uh, technical data. I had no idea what they were talking about, but I could look it up. So, yes. And then after Peter, I took 20 years off and wrote about the coming of the First World War and forgot some of it. Then the bones were discovered, and I went back to it and went there and did a John and I were talking about it at lunch, the excavation and the verification of the bones by DNA, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, I was out of money. Everybody thinks writers are rich, particularly if once in a while they have a successful book. But we're on our own. We don't have salaries. We don't have, uh, I'm not whining. Uh, but just to explain, we're not all John Grisham uh, or Stephen King. Uh, and so you have to uh, hurry along faster than you, you would wish. Uh, and so Catherine the Great was suggested. Massey has written Nicholas, Peter, why, why not Catherine? I didn't want to. 
And, uh, but they, uh, what is it in The Godfather? They made me an offer I couldn't refuse because I have lots of children uh, and they like to eat. But um, we, we agreed and uh, my editor, a famous old editor who had edited William Faulkner in the 50s and so forth, said, Bob, why didn't you want to do this? I said, because it's been so, done so often. There are lots of biographies. She died in, in the end of the uh, 18th century. Uh, every 10 or 15 years, there's a book. Been a book about her in some language or another, different styles, different languages. Uh, it's enough. And he said, yeah, I know that. Which one would you say was the best? And I thought he was asking an honest question and said, um, I haven't read more than a couple of, you know, there are scholarly books, which some professor has found out something he thinks will surely get him tenure. And uh, uh, somebody has decided to make another uh, issue of Catherine's sex life uh, and so forth and so on. But um, I said, you know, I don't know. I just know that if I were to write a book about Catherine, I wouldn't do it the way any of these are done. He said, you see? So they made me an offer, and thank God, I, I spent eight years with the, this admirable woman. Um, I have four daughters. I want them to learn from her example. I'll tell you one other thing. Uh, I met the German Consul General a year ago in, in New York, and he said, uh, I really enjoyed your book. I wonder if you know uh, uh, anything about our Chancellor, Angela Merkel. Well, I, I said, I know she's the most powerful woman politician in the world. Yes, she is that. Uh, and she has, I, I was her chief of protocol for several years. She has on her desk a framed photograph of a portrait of Catherine the Great every day. <laughs> so these are two little German girls who came out of what came for a while, East Germany, who went to the top. And I found her, uh, admirable and remarkable, uh, not wholly, uh, you know, I didn't do her perfectly. Uh, I did her warts and all. So uh, I uh, learned more Russian just as I went along. Yes, sir. That's a great question. Um, I tape recorded and I listened to it um, my headphones when I walked or when I was driving. Um, and then also I, um, I really immersed myself in the music because a lot of the rhythm of the speech seems to come from the musical tradition, the oral tradition of um, sort of that started probably with song. So I um, spent a lot of time in the blues library at Ole Miss and just hours listening to the, um, to the music. And then I, um, I always read out loud when I edit. And uh, I had a very, you know, a lot of good friends down south, but one of them was Johnny Little, who was a um, professor of English. And he'd studied with Eudora Welty, and he was a really good editor. And he was the one who really went through the book and sort of with an ear um, 
for authenticity, not only in dialogue, but in everything. But I spent a ton of time just sort of listening. Listening. How did you get people to let you record them? How would you, what would you do? Oh, that was no problem. They would I'd be like, honey, can I turn on the tape recorder while you tell us, sir, you can turn on a tape recorder, no problem. So it would be like fishing. People took me fishing. They took me to jute joints. They, you know, we'd be like drinking moonshine on somebody's porch and I'd have my little, they didn't care. They'd be like, yeah, sure, that's, I mean, my second book, I was, the second book is about, um, a drug bust that happened in Atlanta over 24 hours, one of the biggest. And um, I'd be in needle lines, and I'd have my tape recorder, and these guys would be like, when did I start shooting up? Let me tell you about it. You know, they well, I didn't care. There was a, <laughs> I'm like, I'm recording you. Oh, yeah, it's fine, darling, no problem. So people love to tell their stories. And it was fine. And, you know, they didn't have a sense that I was going to, like, put it on the radio or anything, you know. Phil's got a question. Well, I don't. Uh, Hold on, I'm pointing to the lady behind you. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, George, go ahead. Uh, you just said that uh, fiction does not have a mask, that nonfiction does have a safety mask. Where is the historical fiction line? What? Where is the what line? Historical, historical fiction. fiction. Historical fiction. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to not step on any, any toes, um, and there is great historical fiction. I guess the greatest I think of is War and Peace. Napoleon is in it. Alexander I is in it. Natasha Rostova is not is is a creation by Tolstoy. Um, I am generally wary of historical fiction. I would rather fi read nonfiction history or novels uh, uh, which don't include historical characters. I mean, which don't uh, bring in historical characters uh, because there aren't many with the talent of Tolstoy or the ability to use the historical figure as a deus ex machina. If, I don't know whether I use that correctly. Uh, I hope you're not a historical fiction writer uh, because uh, my wife loves Hilary Mantel and various people who do it superbly. And she knows what I'm talking about. I, she thinks she agrees with me from my perspective. Uh, she can keep separate historical fiction from history. Uh, I, I tend to blur them, especially if the historical fiction is better than the history. You know, it's written more uh, dramatically and memorably and so forth. Um, but I, uh, I think there are such good stories uh, from hi real history, if you could tell them accurately, and if they're meaningful, uh, that, that I don't, you know, I've gotten to an age where I have to ration my time. And I want to know more about this, that, and the other that's really happened than what might have happened if. That's a bad answer. It doesn't really tell you much. But I'm, uh, it's thin ice for me. I'm afraid I'm going to fall in and get soaking wet. Uh, maybe I'm just scared. If it's much better than what uh, Bob Caro and David McCullough and people like me write, what have, been, what have we been doing all these years? Yeah. Now, those conversations, were they, were they real conversations, or were they any of that? They were real conversations in the, 
I'll tell you, I couldn't have written the first half of the book uh, the way I did, which is takes her almost up to the moment she became empress, ha through ha the first half of her life, without her memoirs. When she was empress, uh, she sat down to explain herself. Well, it was more complicated than that, but basically she was explaining herself to her son and her grandson, who, both of whom became emperor after her. And she knew that there was a lot of uh, scandal mongering and, and uh, did she have a, an active role in the murder of her husband? Uh, was Paul really the son of her husband or one of her first lovers? Et cetera. Did she, was she married to Potemkin? Et cetera. And uh, so she wrote, not in uh, the form that I write or Suzanne writes, a really sequential uh, account of her life. She wrote it in the form of long letters to friends and the British ambassador who was a great supporter. And some of them were in the form of a direct memoir uh, year by year. Uh, but she tells the stories. And she was, among other remarkable things, a great writer. She captured uh, the details, it, as far as I can tell. Uh, those conversations are in her memoirs. And uh, who knows whether she polished them up or altered the direction. The brilliant dialogue between her and the Empress, where she handles the uh, problem of her uh, lack of power. She's going to be dumped as Peter's wife and so forth. She says, uh, she goes to the Empress and says, Your Majesty, I want to go home. She's been there 18 years. The Empress is shocked and says, why? Because I have failed to please your Imperial Majesty. Everything that Elizabeth says, Elizabeth, Elizabeth has been threatening to send her home, but she certainly doesn't want her to go home. You, you know that passage if you read it. Uh, Catherine leads her up against a number of blank walls. But you have children. Your Imperial Majesty will take far better care of them than I ever could. You know, and what's the Empress going to say? That's all word for word. And you can check me out by going to the bookstore if there's still one in town. Uh, well, Ann Patchett has one, doesn't she? Uh, and buying or asking them to order the uh, modern library, Catherine the Great's memoirs. And you'll see that Massey has helped himself, literally, <laughs> to half of the stuff in his first. I've rewritten it, so I can't be directly accused, accused of plagiarism. But without it, without what she writes about her relationship with her mother and her husband and the empress and her various early lovers, uh, it would have been a pale uh, sh shadow of the story she tells, and I borrow from her. John. Well, I don't have a question, Will. I think you've done a terrific job again, and the audience has added to that. Uh, I do just want to take a moment to remind us all how lucky we are to have this public library that welcomes uh, these and other sessions uh, exalting the role of the writer. And, uh, and Elaine, at least one more time, thank you so much for, <laughs> for what you and, and, and the staff here does to make this place so accessible to, to all of us. <clears throat> and finally, let me just say a word about, about these Sunday afternoon meetings. Uh, I don't know about all of you, but I look around the room and I do know that there, uh, it just goes to the heart of why Will and I thought this might be a good idea. Um, there are three people in the room I know about, 
um, one of whom has a manuscript actively looking for a publisher, another of whom has a publisher and is actively involved in a something close to a bitter controversy about the interpretation of what's there. And finally, there's a third, uh, there's a third uh, author here uh, who's published a book. And uh, there are publishers who died to get Marshall Chapman to write another one. Uh, <laughs> and we all hope you do. And I'm counting on you <laughs> writing at least one more. I, I, I thought about it, Marshall, the night that uh, Jimmy Buffett called you out of the audience and said, perform on this stage, and you came down. And I will tell you, her interaction with people in that industry um, has to be, there's, there's got to be another compelling, maybe three books there. But anyway, I, I, I would just say that, that uh, with those three examples, I, I'll tell you, I think there, there, there's more benefit, uh, Bob and Suzanne, uh, than you will ever know, than Will and I ever know, uh, flow from, from these sessions. So thanks to the library. Thanks to all of you for coming. Hope you come again. And thanks most of all, Suzanne, my friend Bob, um, and my colleague Will. <laughs>